I have an announcement. I don't want to be called a Christian anymore. I want to be called a friend of Jesus. So begins a sermon by Maggie Stoddard. Pondering it, it sounded pretty good to me. I wouldn't mind giving up this cumbersome title of Christian. At my school, we're constantly making identity charts to share ourselves with each other. I'm a bit tired of putting down the word Christian and having people stare at me like I've announced I send bombs through the mail. At the same time, I'm not sure putting friend of Jesus would improve things. John is focused on love. He says that again and again and again, that if we love as we are loved, if we can take that powerful, affirming, justice-rooted love that comes from God and beam it to others, well, then our joy will be complete. I love that phrase, your joy will be complete. I know the feel of it in my mouth. It's what I want for my children, for my friends. I want them to know the joy of relationship with God, and I want their joy to be complete. Someone on Desperate Preacher said, it's easy to be a servant. One afternoon of making sandwiches or giving a ride. The hard thing is the day in and day out demands of showing up and being a friend. This discussion is the reason I so loathe the term friend on Instagram and Facebook, as if that were friendship. Sending out a photo of my happiness or my politics with no real place for interaction or human nuance or comfort. We have sold our children a myth that the endless superficiality of social media can provide friendship, when in fact friendship is such incredibly hard work, is so demanding of love and attention and mothering and nurturing. When Jesus says his disciples are his friends, he is not weakening the demand. He is tripling it. I've been listening to a podcast by Beth Moore called Chasing Vines. I got interested in her because she is a prolific female Christian teacher and preacher who left her denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, because she felt their political stances were anti-Christian. She reportedly lost millions of dollars and has been public excoriated for that decision. So I approached her book with some hope and some trepidation. And there are times when she is too conservative or too fundamentalist to reach me. But there are other times when she stops me in, her tra in my tracks, when she articulates a truth about God beautifully and powerfully. Recently in my car, she was recounting her quest to know herself. She said she, was her, she sees herself as a summer girl, but has come to admit that she hates the grit and blow of sand at the beach. She said, no, she's really a winter girl, but she hates being cold. She thought maybe the fall, but then she realized fall sports trouble her. And so it went. It reminded me of my lifelong lack of surety about where I want to live or spend my summers, how I want to be both a world traveler and buckle down in just one place and move to a religious community and live in New York City and go back to Jamaica. How is it possible to still be unsettled to be wrestling all the time with possible plans, possible ideas, possible dreams. How is it possible, she asks, to still be so up in the up to still be so up in the air, to so often feel uncomfortable, like we're not enough, or too much, or in the wrong place, or at the wrong time? How is it reasonable to be forever plagued by all those feelings and insecurity? She muses that this lack of comfort is perhaps what God imagined and designed our lives to be. That the Christian has to keep growing like the vine and changing and adapting, that it's part of our calling. That we are pushed internally to always be a little bit dissatisfied, to have a forever sense, a nagging sense, that we could be, should be more or different my daughter has the expression, seek discomfort on her wall. To her, it means go skydiving, get a tattoo, you only live once. But I suspect seeking discomfort is something else altogether. I suspect it means seeking the discomfort requisite in friendship with Jesus. I suspect it means that our inner qualms and strivings are indicative 
of just how challenging the commitment to being Jesus' friend truly is. Being Jesus' friend means, and I'm quoting here, it means the need to regard every single relationship in life as sacred, no matter how minuscule the association is. It means that every decision I make in life has to be thoroughly checked for its loving intent. Remaining attached to God and his love for me is the hardest thing I have ever encountered, and I encounter it every day. I encounter it in the trifold love affair which says, if God loves me and God loves you, then I am required to love you and you me. Can we? Can I love you with all your dishonesty and recklessness and discomfort? Can I love you? Can I let you love me? We can abide in God. We can allow ourselves to be pruned by God, to be cut back so that we can focus on bearing fruit. And that fruit is loving others and checking every decision for loving intent. There is a student who during the pandemic, every day in Zoom class, I came to strongly dislike. She rarely claimed to cl came to class. She never did homework. She was miserable and spread that misery to her right and to her left. Every time she failed a quiz, if she deigned to take it, I would remind herself, it's her, not me. She's the one who isn't investing anything. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. At some point, it's back on them. I was very righteous in my stance. And then, after a year, in-person school started again. Surprisingly, she came to school. She sits in the back of the room, bolstered by large amounts of snack in multiple baggies from home. She wears her co winter coat even on warmest days and keeps her giant backpack on. She looks uncomfortable and angry, like she's armored up and ready to fight. She isn't following any of the rules, and my job is to teach her. My job is to be her friend. I head into the first day assuming this will be an impossible calling, but the minute I see her squared up there like a skydiver with the straps on, something melts me a little. Something calls me to her, and somehow it has worked. Somehow every day she smiles a little more and tries a little harder and asks a few questions. We are getting in a groove, she and I. We are becoming friends. Sometimes being a friend of and for Jesus means breaking the rules, means leading with your determination to love someone else and letting the rest fall away. In the reading from Acts, Peter refuses to follow the rules. He refuses to follow the rules that say Jesus only came for the Jewish people or for one sect. He was as Jesus' friend, his true friend, and as such, he absorbed valuable lessons from him. Lessons about being willing to heal on the Sabbath, to eat with tax collectors, to embrace the lepers, to heal the Sumerian woman. Peter has learned the need for loving intent. And when he sees those Gentiles experience that joy, that complete joy, he refuses to deny them the waters of baptism. My guess is, we're not supposed to be deciding who's in and who's out, who deserves the love and who doesn't. My guess is we are just supposed to keep showing up again and again, offering our and God's love, offering friendship and seeking discomfort. Amen.